The serene planet of Ripple Star, home to these cute fairy inhabitants who live in blissful prosperity and are in charge of this poorly guarded crystal of unimaginable power. I mean, what could go wrong? Somehow, dark matter returned. <laughs> and everyone gets swallowed into darkness, except this one fairy named Ribbon, who grabs their crystal of incredible power and flees into space with dark matter in hot pursuit. Stop. She doesn't get very far. Dark Matter shatters the crystal and sends Ribbon plummeting down onto Popstar, the home of Kirby. And we get this scene where another celestial being happens to land on Kirby's head. Oh man, not again! The two become fast friends after Kirby realizes Ribbon's situation and helps her merge two of the crystal shards together, kicking off another adventure. But this time, we're in 3D, baby! Welcome to Kirby 64, the Crystal Shards, released for the Nintendo 64 in March 2000. This would serve as Kirby's official transition into 3D. Technically, his first 3D appearance is in Super Smash Bros., but that's not what this video is about. We're continuing our journey to explore every game in the Kirby franchise, and there's three videos before this, so if you missed them, go get caught up, because this little limited series here might be a Netflix series someday. Yeah. <laughs> so with Kirby on board to help Ribbon collect all the crystal shards, we begin his new adventure as they journey off into the lands of Popstar. Even though the levels are now in full 3D, they play similarly to previous titles in the series, keeping the general flow of a 2D side-scroller. Kirby and Ribbon will journey to six unique planets, each with three or four stages and a boss battle. The Popstar levels feel like a condensed version of Kirby's Dream Land 3, as Kirby spends these levels saving possessed citizens of Popstar. Kirby takes on an artist character named Adeline, who looks and fights a lot like Otto from Dream Land 3. But apparently, they're not the same character. More on that later. And Kirby will also run into King DDD, who finds a crystal shard at the top of his castle. At first, he's reluctant to give it to Kirby, but Dark Matter uses this opportunity to possess him once again. How many times has DDD gotten possessed at this part of the series? I'm gonna start keeping count. One, two, but after Kirby defeats DDD and returns him to Sound Mind, he decides to join the adventure to find the Crystal Shards. Adeline and Wadadi will also join the party, making this the final team to go and save the galaxy. So while Kirby and friends take off into the stars, how was this title developed? With Masahiro Sakurai busy on his new Super Smash Bros. project and Kirby Air Ride, who at Hal was in charge of this one? We'll have to go back three years prior to 1997. Hal is already at work on their first 3D Kirby game before Kirby's Dream Land 3 is even released for the Super Nintendo. With 3D graphics as the new big wave in gaming, Hal wanted Kirby to follow suit. Takashi Saito was the project manager for Kirby 64, tasked with keeping a schedule for the development process. And at the same time, Shinichi Shimomura, known for his work on Kirby's Dream Land 2 and 3, would return to direct this title. The game was initially slated for the 64DD, a disc peripheral for the Nintendo 64 that was supposed to add a graphical and performance boost to the console. I discussed the 64DD in more detail in my Ocarina of Time video as there are plans for Zelda content for this device as well, but still, due to poor sales in Japan, it would never see a Western release, and many of the games planned for it would just get a cartridge version instead. Kirby 64 was no exception. With Shimomura returning as director, similar themes from his previous games would return to Kirby 64, like the presence of Dark Matter, possessed characters, and Adeline, who was the reinterpretation of Addo from Dream Land 3. So a quick tangent here. Hal has never directly addressed whether these two people are the same person or not. For Kirby's 20th anniversary, they released a special encyclopedia called 20th Anniversary Kirby Poo 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 Encyclopedia, and it addresses this confusion by discussing their similarities and stating Otto could be a nickname for Adeline, but no conclusions ended up being drawn here. According to WickHirby, Addo is rarely mentioned anymore, with Adeline being the only one referenced in the supplementary Kirby materials these days. But here's my headcanon. Perhaps Otto is this long-lost twin sister that Adeline smothered with a pillow in her sleep, and everyone in Dreamland has agreed not to talk about it. So RIP to Otto. Maybe we'll see you again someday. Are you good, bro? Like <laughs> Okay, back to Kirby 64. Gameplay-wise, if you've seen other games in the series, Kirby 64 should be pretty familiar to you. This time, Kirby only has access to seven copy abilities. Burn, Stone, Ice, Needle, Bomb, Spark, and Cutter. But here's the twist. You can combine abilities this time around. Suppose Kirby inhales two enemies with abilities he can copy. In this situation, he gains what's called a power combo, allowing him to utilize up to 28 combinations of abilities, like Burn Ice or Needle Spark. And assuming the enemy has an ability you can copy, the player can also obtain power combos by inhaling an enemy and spitting it out at another enemy. 
This creates an ability star that Kirby can inhale to get the power combo. While this game was initially planned to have multiple playable characters, the final game only has a playable Kirby, and to a lesser extent, DDD. King DDD is playable in certain levels and can use his hammer to knock down walls and other obstacles while Kirby rides on his back. Different levels will have Waddle Dee pilot certain vehicles for you as well, like the minecart and sled. As for the levels themselves, there are three crystal shards in each stage, and one for each boss, making a total of 74 shards that the player must collect throughout the game to get the final ending. So we return to Team Kirby, who have collected the shards from five other planets. Now it's time for Ribbon to return to her home in Ripple Star and deal with the threat of darkness. darkness. With her planet covered in Dark Matter's yeah, Darkness why? and her friends and queen possessed, the team face off against the mastermind behind the Dark Matters this time, Miracle Matter. I can't tell what this is supposed to be, but I hope there's a D20 dice out there with this design. Miracle Matter takes on forms that are based on Kirby's copy abilities within the game, and it can only be damaged by using that specific copy power against it, which goes against everything I learned from Pokemon games, but after a trying battle, Kirby expels the darkness from Ripple Star, saving Ribbon and her people. And if you haven't collected all the crystal shards up to this point, the game ends, with Kirby and his friends heading back to Popstar as Ribbon and the Queen say goodbye. And just as Kirby is out of eyeshot, the Queen gives a blood-curdling glare to Ribbon as the screen quickly fades to black and the credits roll. Unfortunately, I never got to play this as a kid, but looking at this now, this actually gave me a slight chill. Alright, so clearly that's not the ending we want, so let's rewind. This time we collected all the crystal shards, which reveals that Dark Matter still possesses the Queen. Dark Matter is expelled from her body, and forms the final stage in Kirby 64, the Dark Star. Without hesitation, Kirby summons a Warp Star, and the whole team heads off into the unknown. There's not much to the level itself leading up to the final boss, but it does show a couple little clips of the team working together, which I thought was kind of cute. But it's in this level that Kirby will uncover the true mastermind behind all the events. Zero Two. No, not that one. Yes, this thing. A sequel to Zero from Kirby's Dreamland 3. It's now a bloody eye with wings this time. And much like the Otto and Adeline debate, we're unsure if this is the same creature as Zero, but I'd like to think it is. His form evolving after his crushing defeat in the last title. But those details aren't important because after getting stomped once again, Zero never returns as a plot device in future Kirby games. But I suppose if Dark Matter is ever around, we can assume Zero waits somewhere in a distant dimension, always watching from the void. The day is saved, for real this time, and the heroes are all awarded a piece of the Crystal Shard for their bravery, and the game ends with Kirby finally getting some play. Oh shit! Yep, that's me. So this ends the Dark Matter trilogy, with Kirby 64 being the last mainline title with Dark Matter as the primary antagonist, though this won't be the last time we see him. But after the release of this game, Kirby wouldn't be gone for too long, because I'm sure as you all know at this point, there's always a spin-off waiting just around the corner. Introducing new tilt response technology. Now you move the Game Boy, not the buttons. Kirby Tilt and Tumble, rated E for everyone, only on Game Boy Color. Kirby Tilt and Tumble was released in the US for the Game Boy Color in April 2001. The plotline for the game is pretty standard, with King DDD once again stealing the stars from Dreamland, but this time Kirby will flex once again by rolling through his entire adventure. So how can I describe this game? I suppose it's very similar to those handheld marble maze games, which coincidentally I compared the concept of Kid Kirby to in my last video. So maybe some of those ideas made their way into this game, though I have no way to fully prove that. But the game is a top-down view of Kirby this time, as the player would physically tilt their Game Boy Color to move Kirby around the stage. The game cartridge itself has a built-in gyro sensor that would detect the movements of the system, which for a Game Boy Color title seems way ahead of its time. The player could also flick the Game Boy upward to have Kirby jump over obstacles. There are 8 levels in total with 4 stages within each level and red stars that must be collected in the stages to get 100% completion. And much like other Kirby spin-offs similar to this, there are boss battles to overcome in this format, as well as bonus mini-games the player can access, like Kirby's Bursta Balloon and Do the Kirby! I totally thought this said Do the Kinky. It's 4 in the morning, so cut me some slack. Nintendo would be the ones to develop Kirby Tilt and Tumble, but interestingly enough, Kirby wasn't originally planned to be the star. In an old interview with Ensider, the director of Tilt and Tumble, Toshiaki Suzuki, revealed their initial idea for the game. Originally, the game was going to be called Koro Monkey, 
monkey tilt and tumble because we are using a monkey character. It's very interesting, but at the same time, we were still pitching several ideas around. While the monkey was quite charming, the emphasis of the game was not very character oriented. We later decided Kirby would be a more suitable character for the game. Strangely enough, Sega would release Super Monkey Ball to the world a few months later. I'm not saying the two are related, but it's just an interesting coincidence. So back in 2001, IGN would also report that the game was almost rebranded as a Pokemon game for its Western release to cash in on the massive thirst for more Pokemon at that time. But ultimately, they backed out of that decision to avoid saturating the market. Either way, this was a small success for Kirby, becoming the sixth best-selling Game Boy Color game in Japan, selling over 500,000 copies. I suppose this response was enough for Nintendo to start working on a sequel for the Nintendo GameCube. At the Nintendo Space World event in 2001, Miyamoto himself demonstrated the gameplay for Kirby Tilt and Tumble 2. This time, the player would have moved around a Game Boy Advance that was connected to the GameCube through a link cable. The game would utilize both screens from the television and Game Boy Advance, with Miyamoto's demo showing Kirby fall off a ledge from the TV screen down onto the Game Boy Advance screen. And while initially it was planned for a May 2002 release, the game was scrapped. It briefly became a title called Rollerama, a version that had Kirby completely removed, replacing him with a regular ball instead. But shortly after this, the game would be cancelled cancelled. Seeing that the original Kirby Tilt and Tumble came out pretty late in the Game Boy Color's life cycle, there was a much bigger handheld project in the works for Kirby, for Nintendo's next portable system, the Game Boy Advance. Kirby! Nightmare in Dreamland! Kirby! That shit is fucking trash, dog. Get the fuck. Kirby Nightmare in Dreamland debuted in late 2002 for the Game Boy Advance, a complete remake of one of Kirby's most significant titles in the series, Kirby's Adventure. I covered the plot of this in my first Kirby video, but let's do a quick refresher. The citizens of Dreamland suddenly stop having dreams, and Kirby is no exception. So he decides to take the initiative and investigate this phenomenon, heading over to the Fountain of Dreams, a fountain that is the source of good dreams in Dreamland. And it's there he discovers that the Star Rod, the source of the fountain's power, has been stolen. King DDD is the culprit behind this theft, breaking the rod into seven pieces and giving them to his minions to guard. So to fix the situation, Kirby rushes off to reclaim the pieces of the Star Rod and restore the Fountain of Dreams. So much like before, the objective is to jump from level to level, defeating the same bosses from the original game. And once he's collected the pieces of the Star Rod, Kirby returns to the Fountain of Dreams and retrieves the very last piece after defeating King DDD. However, after Kirby places it back on the fountain, there are consequences to his actions. DDD split the Star Rod to protect Dreamland from a dark force. Nightmare is released from the fountain, and he aims to wreak havoc across Dreamland. This leads to the final boss with Nightmare on the moon. But with the help of the Star Rod, Kirby makes quick work of Nightmare and destroys a good portion of the moon in the process. Man, Kirby is a menace in this game. But with Nightmare destroyed and the Star Rod returned to the Fountain of Dreams, peace returns to Dreamland. So overall, not much changed in the story here. But gameplay-wise, Nightmare in Dreamland is not just a graphically superior version of Kirby's adventure. It has all the essential features from the original, like Kirby's 24 different copy abilities, all eight levels and the same bosses. However, seeing this is a brand new game engine, the gameplay is smoother, and many quality of life changes were made to the overall mechanics. There were also three new sub-games added called Bomb Rally, Kirby's Air Grind, and Quick Draw, and the player would have the opportunity to play these mini games through optional doorways within regular stages, but they were also available from the main menu as well. You could even play as Meta Knight in an unlockable Meta Nightmare mode, though this doesn't really add anything to the story. It's more of a time attack option to complete the game as quickly as possible. Starring Meta Knight though, that's something, right? But the most significant addition to this remake is the option to play alongside four other players. Shout out to anyone who managed to get a four player session going when this game came out, because not only did you need three friends, but you needed three friends who had Game Boy Advance systems. And those three friends also needed to have bought this game. And those same three friends also needed to have link cables on hand. <laughs> so maybe some of you had better luck with this than I did. But technically, you could play Nightmare in Dreamland with three other friends using one copy of the game, but you couldn't play the main campaign together. You were restricted to the three mini games that were added to this game. So Nightmare in Dreamland would be the first remake for a mainline game in the series. So why did the folks at HAL Laboratory decide on Kirby's Adventure? Why not just make a brand new game? Well, around this time, a Kirby animation was airing in Japan and the US known as Kirby Right Back At You. Well, in Japan, it was just Kirby of the Stars, which is the name of the Kirby series over there. But while this show was bringing in new fans to the Kirby franchise, 
how Laboratory had no new Kirby game planned to ship alongside the animation, and they agreed this wasn't a good business decision, so their time was limited. And instead of yet another spin-off, they had the idea to port an older game to the Game Boy Advance. Masahiro Sakurai, who at this time was the chief director of the Kirby series, initially suggested a port of one of the Super Nintendo titles or an entirely new game. They abandoned the idea of a port, worried that audiences would view it as stale, and due to the currently airing animation, there was no time to develop a brand new game. So that left Kirby's Adventure as the game to remake, due to its solid balance for beginner and advanced players. Shinichi Shimamura will return as the director this time, teaming up with Sakurai on this project. There's an old Nintendo Dream interview from 2002 with Sakurai and the other developers, Eitaro Nakamura and Teruhiko Suzuki, who described their biggest challenge with the game was getting 4-player multiplayer to work. It was a brand new feature, and we had to work within the constraints of the original Famicom game, so it was very difficult. It was so hard getting the 4 linked GBAs to stay synced up. Even 1-2 to two months before release, it wasn't working properly. So one day we were having a meeting and Sakurai asks us, Guys, is this really gonna work? In addition to this, the team had other ambitious ideas they wanted to include like a fourth minigame and a unique dance for Kirby for each copy ability. But due to memory limitations and time constraints, these ideas had to be abandoned. Despite the challenges and this crazy link cable orgy situation, Nightmare in Dreamland was a successful GBA title selling just under a million copies. But this title would be the last Kirby game directed by Shinichi Shimomura. In fact, this guy would completely disappear from HAL Laboratory and the gaming industry after 2002. The fate of Shimomura is a topic brought up in quite a few Kirby circles, with speculation on where Shimomura could be now. Some speculate he was unhappy at HAL and left the gaming industry altogether to live a private life. Others believe that Shinichi Shimomura is just an alter ego for another prominent developer at HAL at that time, like Satoru Iwata. Sakurai himself, or Shigesato Itoi, who was responsible for the Mother series. Reading up on this almost sent me down an entirely different rabbit hole, but what's interesting is that there's only a couple of old pictures of this mysterious director from 1994, and this specific picture only made its rounds because somebody dug it up as recently as 2019. And it just surprises me that someone known for being involved in several influential titles for one of the most well-known gaming characters can just successfully spirit away like that. I'm not saying anyone should be hunting this man down, by the way, I just think it's a pretty fascinating mystery. As for Masahiro Sakurai, by the time Nightmare in Dreamland hit the market, he was two titles into his successful Super Smash Bros. series. It was time to direct his next and final Kirby title. If you can't beat him, eat him. Kirby Air Ride for the Nintendo GameCube released in 2003. It's a racing title starring Kirby that can be kind of described as a kart racer, but I would say this game has some really unique mechanics that set it apart from others. Kirby races on his Air Ride machine, which starts off as a warp star, but there's other cool machines with different stats that you can use, like these wheelies. The game simplifies typical racing mechanics, and instead of holding down a button to accelerate, Kirby will just move forward automatically. Instead, the A button is used for a variety of things like braking, but if you hold down the brake long enough, Kirby will also charge up for a boost. The player uses the control stick to steer and maneuver, and during the race, can even inhale enemies to obtain copy abilities that can be used offensively. Surprisingly, there's no story for Kirby Air Ride, just three modes. Air Ride, Top Ride, and City Trial. Air Ride is the main campaign where Kirby will progress through eight different courses and an unlockable ninth one, while collecting new machines that can be used in future races. Meta Knight and King DDD are the other two playable characters that can be unlocked during Air Ride mode. Three other players can also join you in the races in this mode, and that's where the competition really heats up. Top Ride mode I'm guessing is probably the least played mode of the bunch. It simplifies the Air Ride formula and changes gameplay to a top-down perspective, and also minimizing the courses into these shorter laps. The objective is to be the first person to reach a certain amount of laps while avoiding obstacles on the track. I guess you can say the objective is the same in air ride mode, but you all get my point. The last mode is called City Trial, which isn't as polished as air ride mode, but I found this to be the most creative of the three. The mode drops the player and three other Kirby clones, whether it's your friends or computers, into a more open environment. And your goal? Explore the area and collect other air ride machines or power-ups for your machine in a limited amount of time. Once time's up, you'll be pitted against the other players at the stadium in a race for glory. But while you're collecting these power-ups and other machines, your opponents can interfere with your work by stealing those power-ups or destroying your machine. Unfortunately, I never got to play this mode with friends, but I think it's a pretty awesome idea.
Kirby Air Ride had Masahiro Sakurai's biggest involvement since Kirby Superstar. And as you navigate through these menus, you'll see a lot of assets, sound effects, and overall aesthetics are very similar to Super Smash Bros. Melee. Even the musical composers were the same. But similarly to Nightmare in Dreamland, Kirby Air Ride was built to be released alongside Kirby right back at you, and a racing game was chosen since it would take less time and resources than a brand new mainline title. But the development of this title goes even further back to the Nintendo 64 days. It would start as a proposed sequel to Kirby's Dream Course, entitled Kirby Bowl 64, with Kirby Bowl being the Japanese name for Kirby's Dream Course. There were two playable demos showcased for this proposed N64 game at the 1995 Nintendo Space World, with one demo having players control a ball-shaped Kirby through an obstacle course, and in multiplayer mode, they'd be able to knock other players off the board. The other demo was a 3D snowboarding race where Kirby's boarding down a slope on a similar terrain to Kirby's Dream Course, grabbing stars for points. So these versions of the game would be cancelled, and as they reworked the concept, it would evolve into a racing game with an emphasis on drifting. Sakurai has mentioned that completing the course designs and art assets required a painstaking amount of work for the team, and even through this dedication, the game didn't feel right. This led Sakurai to make the difficult decision of rebuilding the game from scratch. But after they made this choice, they managed to complete the game in only three and a half months. At the time of release, Kirby Air Ride sold 422,000 copies in Japan and 750,000 copies in the US, but was also met with some mixed reviews. With F-Zero GX released shortly before, and Mario Kart Double Dash slated for release later that year, reviewers saw it as quote, the awkward middle child, with GameSpot going as far to say it felt like a bit of a throwaway due to its overly simplified gameplay. Despite all this, I see many Kirby fans look at this game positively, with many begging for some type of remaster or remake for modern consoles. And as for Masahiro Sakurai, this would be his final game at HAL Laboratory. It was tough for me to see that every time I made a new game, people automatically assume that a sequel was coming. Even if it's a sequel, lots of people have to give their all to make a game. But some people think the sequel process happens naturally. If I want to keep producing games as a business, then staying at HAL would be a more stable place to do that. But I don't care about that sort of stability. Right now I'm far more concerned about the fact that the game industry, which is built from the balance between developers, publishers, and users, is beginning to fall apart at the seams. Shortly after the release of Kirby Air Ride, he stepped down as chief director for the Kirby series, going off to open his independent studio, Sora Limited, mainly becoming a contractor for Nintendo as director of the Smash Brothers series and Kid Icarus Uprising. Please, Sakurai, follow up on that game. So with the creator and two significant directors retiring from HAL Laboratory, what the heck was next for Kirby? you're in trouble, call for backup. You can call on the powers of your new friends, unlock puzzles, defeat enemies, and gain new abilities in Kirby in the Amazing Mirror. Kirby in the Amazing Mirror, released for the Game Boy Advance in 2004. But just for context here, this was the third game that HAL Laboratory planned to cash in on while the Right Back At You animation was airing, even though it wasn't released until after the show concluded. The game begins with a giant mirror in the sky, introducing the concept of an alternate dimension to Dreamland called the Mirror World. Mirror World seems to be facing some threat, a dark entity that attempts to attack Dreamland. Meta Knight, who seems to sense this danger, flies toward Mirror World to handle the monstrosity, to keep Dreamland safe. Soon after, Kirby, who is just minding his own business, gets attacked by Meta Knight, causing him to split into four different Kirbys. You're not fooling us though, we know that's you, Kibi. Meta Knight just flies off, so the four Kirbys follow him into the Mirror World to figure out what the heck's going on. And so, our game begins. We find out that the Meta Knight that attacked Kirby was obviously an imposter, with the two Meta Knights fighting within Mirror World, but the Dark One is victorious and sends Meta Knight deeper into the realm, shattering the mirror in the process. We also get a glimpse of a dark version of Kirby wandering around, but let's not worry about him for now. The Kirbys have to collect the mirror shards to help Meta Knight and save Dreamland from whatever threat is at work here. And this game was the first new mainline title since Kirby 64, adding an interesting twist to the gameplay style. The adventure takes place on one massive map within Mirror World, home to 10 unique areas that can be mostly explored in any order. Rainbow Route is the start of Kirby's new adventure and serves as the bridge to many of the other areas within the game. Though it's the largest of the nine, it's the only area that doesn't have a boss waiting for the Kirbys. So the player will tackle the other areas Metroidvania style, collecting items and treasure chests like the Vitality Boost, which will increase Kirby's maximum health. But there's also maps and other goodies and collectibles as well in these chests. 
Four player multiplayer makes a return, which is a really fun idea in this game because the players can take on the divide and conquer strategy, separating into different parts of the map and exploring each area separately. An item that makes a return from its cameo in Kirby 64 is the cell phone, which Kirby can whip out during multiplayer to request help from other players for puzzles or bosses for instance. Kirby in the Amazing Mirror has 26 copy abilities packed in this time, with 6 new abilities making their debut in this game. There's Cupid, which allows Kirby to fly and shoot arrows, Magic, a single use ability similar to Cook, which triggers a roulette with different effects like invincibility or summoning Meta Knight to take out enemies on screen. Then there's Master, an ability that allows Kirby to use Meta Knight's sword. Mini, which has Kirby become... Mini Kirby. Missile, which is pretty self-explanatory. And Smash, which transforms Kirby into his Super Smash Brothers counterpart, allowing him to use his abilities from the game, which I think is pretty awesome. Kirby in the Amazing Mirror also has brand new bosses that the Kirbys will take on in the Mirror World. Each one is an original boss except for Krakow, which is basically tradition at this point. But for instance, instead of Wispy Woods again, Kirby will take on King Gollum, a stone tower within the abandoned Moonlight Mansion area. But my favorite inclusion is none other than Master Hand and Crazy Hand from the Smash Brothers series, making their first and only cameo as a boss within the series. This feels like a game directed by Sakurai, but how Laboratory would outsource development this time around to other studios, Flagship and Dimps. Flagship is somewhat of a subsidiary of Capcom, responsible for helping out with early Resident Evil titles and fully developing games like Legend of Zelda, Oracle of Seasons, and Oracle of Ages. Dimps is a well-known Japanese independent studio that has developed several Sonic handheld titles and Dragon Ball games. So these teams together made Kirby and the Amazing Mirror happen, using assets from Nightmare and Dreamland as a jump-off point. And though Sakurai departed from HAL Laboratory at this stage of Kirby's timeline, he was still involved as an advisor to this project, which would explain some of the Smash Bros. cameos within the game. In fact, the idea for this game came about during a meeting in 2003 between Sakurai and Flagship's president at the time, Yoshiki Okamoto. But by crazy coincidence, they'd both leave their companies before the project moved forward. So HAL Laboratory would contract Sakurai after his departure to see the project through. So with that said, let's bring our story home. The Kirbys managed to collect all the mirror shards, dealing with the occasional run-in with the Kirby doppelganger walking around and the fake Meta Knight in one boss encounter. But once they deliver all the shards to the mirror where Meta Knight is trapped, the portal is restored and they head into Dimension Mirror, where Meta Knight awaits. Just kidding, it's Dark Meta Knight. Damn. And Kirby takes him on once again in this final epic battle. But it's not over yet, as another portal appears where more evil awaits. And Kirby jumps right in with the real Meta Knight offering his help by tossing Kirby his sword. And so the true mastermind behind everything is revealed, Dark Mind. This is the thing who is attempting to control Mirror World and whose evil is leaking into Dreamland. Kirby will have to fight this guy four times across multiple stages, but like many other Kirby bosses, this brutish form is just a front to something much more menacing lying beneath. After Kirby's fourth win, the true Dark Mind emerges. Come on now, dawg. Yep, it's another evil eye. The appearance of this thing is often compared to Dark Matter, but I see more of a resemblance to Zero. I'd even venture to say that Dark Mind is the mirror version of Zero lurking within his own dimension within the mirror dimension. So once you beat this form, Dark Mind will attempt to flee, and Kirby will hop on his warp star to finish the job. The craziest part about this battle is that Kirby takes this ass whooping into the credits. Yes, while the credits roll, the player can just keep molly whopping this thing. Can someone in the comments let me know if any other game has done this before? Because none come to mind right now. So after the credits roll, the game ends with the Kirbys bringing peace to the mirror world. While this dark Kirby is revealed to be the Mirror World Kirby, who was supposed to be protecting it in the first place. Why weren't you doing anything this entire game? And another thing, this game ends with all four Kirbys heading back to Dreamland. So is Kirby officially four people now? Am I supposed to assume that if there are multiple playable Kirbys in future titles, they're the ones from this game? Alright, let me not think too hard about this. Kirby in the Amazing Mirror sold 620 copies by 2006, slightly less in comparison to Nightmare in Dreamland, but the critics gave it pretty positive reviews. The game currently has an 80 on Metacritic, one point less than Nightmare in Dreamland. But if I were to recommend any Kirby game on the Game Boy Advance, it would be Kirby and the Amazing Mirror, mainly because they set out to try a new formula, and it's the only new mainline title on the system before we start getting into the Nintendo DS era of Kirby games. But let me know what you think in the comments, Nightmare in Dreamland, Amazing Mirror, or both. So that's Kirby's transition into 3D, I guess with some handheld titles mixed in. But I know there's some details missing on a certain animation and some comics as well, so stay tuned. The Prophet has spoken.